That looks good. Thank you, Radek. The floor is yours. You can hear me. Uh, if, it, if it doesn't work, just shout. Uh, I'm Radek Zaid. Uh, don't worry much about the last name. It's a Czech last name. Uh, <clears throat> this should be a talk about the cloud, <clears throat> IPv6, and the enterprise. Uh, it's not like a direct comparison of features, as in like uh, going through a list of features that do, are and are not supported in each of the three biggest cloud providers. It's more like things that you should be uh, taking care of when you want to go to the cloud and deploy IPv6 in there. Uh, a short introduction, I'm working on IPv6 related topics for 15 years now. Uh, I was working on the ISP side with Czech T-Mobile, on the content side with the, uh, like the Czech Google, says so not CZ, the largest content provider in the Czech Republic. And uh, for the past few years, I'm working with Chomex, uh, which is basically uh, a streaming service in Africa. And now the Showmax engineering team is merging with Sky and, and Comcast. So this is an unauthorized use of the Sky logo in here. Don't, don't tell anyone. Uh, <laughs> uh, OK, so let's start about the enterprises. Uh, so enterprises have traditionally operated the on-premises infrastructure. But in the past, some enabled IPv6. Uh, on, on the public side. So for example, this is one of the largest US enterprises, uh, Amazon, who has just recently enabled IPv6 at the edge. The web property that, that they have, the main, main store, amazon.com, was IPv6 enabled just recently. And they do support IPv6 in their own cloud for 10 plus years. Uh, and they have enabled IPv6 on amazon.com using Akamai, which is a competing CDN to what they provide to their customers. So sometimes it's not really easy to go for, for an IPv6 enabled uh, journey. Uh, you have to sometimes use services that are not like the primary uh, services that you, that you build, that you own, that you operate, and the main, main partners that you work with. Uh, so let me pause for a while. Uh, do you have IPv6 implementation plans? Some of you. I hope so. Yes, some hands. Do those plans include cloud operations? Cloud deployments and stuff. David? <laughs> OK, 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 good. Uh, today we are all moving to the cloud, sort of, uh, as, a cust as customers or as uh, infrastructure operators or um, the enterprise business uh, is moving to the cloud. Uh, so that's, that's like by all, it really includes all, even the enterprises. And some enterprises either want or need IPv6. Uh, well, why need? Uh, because in some of these cases, there are mandates, like the US mandate that forces you to IPv6 enable your services, or even go for IPv6 only deployments. Uh, so you have no other choice than just to, to, to go and enable IPv6 uh, in the cloud, as well as on premises. And the question is, what is the cloud? <laughs> so from my point of view, the cloud is everything as a service, and that includes IPv6 feature disparity as a service. Because as you will see, uh, there are features that, are, that exist in the IPv4 world, but not in the IPv6 world. So that's why feature disparity. So the cloud, in theory, can be like uh, infrastructure, storage, uh, like file storage, object storage, databases, applications, anything, and everything as a service. And then there is the hybrid cloud, which is basically you can have like two clouds working together, or you can have a cloud and on-premises uh, infrastructure that you use as the cloud, the on-premises cloud services. So something that has an API that you can provision with automation, that you can deploy services to run Kubernetes on, and so on and so forth. Uh, so let's think about the services that you can find in the cloud. The CDNs. The CDNs have traditionally provided IPv6 uh, for the past 10 years or so. Akamai has been uh, the founding uh, organization of the IPv6 World uh, Day and IPv6 World Launch 12 and uh, 11 years ago. And they do support IPv6. So in this case, this is an example of CloudFront, which is supporting IPv6 since 2016. Uh, in general, today, all these CDNs support IPv6, but in some cases, you have to explicitly 
go to the configuration and IPv6 enable the configurations that you use within the cloud provider or with, with the CDN provider. So the, the key takeaway here is, it's not on by default. And even Akamai, if you have some older configuration and uh, they didn't enable IPv6 by default 10 years ago. So if you have an older configuration and you want to enable IPv6 on the CDN, you have to enable it there. What happens next? Uh, for example, with uh, uh, Cloudflare, they have this beautiful feature that you can enable, and they forward IP addresses of the clients to your applications. And on Cloudflare, uh, there is a feature that allows you to say, my application doesn't support IPv6 addresses. So Cloudflare takes the IPv6 address, hashes it, and converts it into the IPv4 address that begins with 250, 251, uh, and so on and so forth. These reserved IPv4 addresses. And if you have Google Captcha on your website and use this feature, uh, then Google considers this to be request, or the users coming from, from those very special IPv4 addresses that the application sees uh, as invalid requests. And you get Captcha over and over and over again. So I recommend fixing your applications uh, instead of enabling this Cloudflare, Cloudflare feature. Uh, it, it is really a tricky one. But again, it's something that uh, is worth uh, checking because the CDN, it's not, it's not it. You have to IPv6 enable whole chain. Then the next in the chain usually is some load, load balancer. In the cloud offerings of Google, Amazon, and Microsoft Azure, Azure uh, these load balancers usually support IPv6, but not all the time. Uh, this is an example of AWS network load balancer, which you can use to load balance IPv6. Uh, since 2020, but not UDP traffic. Uh, of, of, on, on, of, so that if you have a UDP load balancer, you can't really enable it to be IPv6 uh, enabled and, and balance the traffic to the, to the applications behind it. So, and there are other load balancers in the AWS infrastructure that were IPv6 enabled uh, in, the, in the previous years. Uh, so sometimes you have to really go and investigate if the feature that you are using is really implemented by the cloud vendor because they will claim that everything is working uh, and everything is all in shine, uh, uh, shiny and so on, but often it isn't. The cloud networks uh, are networks like no other. It is not a layer two network like the, the ethernet network and it is, it's not a layer three network, the IP or IPv6 network either. Uh, the cloud providers have some very special uh, deployments that uh, fake, basically the, the, the deployments fake uh, the neighbor discovery and other resolution protocol and so on and so forth. So sometimes if you want to just get an IP address, uh, you have to use a standard protocol like, like DHCP v6, which is pretty common in the cloud environment. You get an IP address uh, from, uh, fr from the network, but you really like can't take that prefix and manually assign an address from the, from the network prefix to uh, any other, uh, or to, to the interface, because the cloud provider will not allow you to source traffic from any other IP address than was allocated by the v 6 Then some providers uh, have a feature that is called prefix delegation, but it doesn't use the v 6 prefix delegation. Uh, you have to use very special APIs of those cloud providers and they will provide you a prefix of a size like slash 80 uh, in case of AWS or uh, slash 96 in case of Google. And then you can take the prefix uh, that you get and uh, for example, run Docker containers on, on the uh, EC2 instance uh, using those, those prefixes and addresses. And these are globally uh, unique addresses that relate to global IPv6 addresses in case of uh, Amazon, the AWS, and GCP, the Google services. But then you have Azure. <laughs> and what did, what did they do? And they didn't fix for the, for the past four years. They did enable the internal networks uh, in the cloud uh, to be IPv6 compatible. And, and you can have virtual machines with IPv6 addresses uh, assigned to them. But you have to do one-to-one -one net uh, to egress from uh, the cloud to the internet. So the question is, 
what addresses do you, do you choose for the internal deployments? You can use ULAs, uh, but in that case, if you have a dual stack virtual machine, then the IPv6 traffic is not preferred. IPv4 traffic is preferred because that's the feature of, of ULAs. Uh, or you can pick any other IPv6 globally routed prefix and, and just take it and, and like squat on that prefix and expect that no one will be using it in the internet, but it's not right. So when it comes to Azure, one-to-one um, -one net is not the way to go forward. I don't know how do they do it with the Kubernetes stack, if they really uh, do one-to-one -one net uh, for every Kubernetes pod. Uh, in the past, they were charging you for, the, for these one-to-one -one translations, uh, even on IPv6. They are not doing it anymore, but still the rest of the implementation is kind of broken uh, this way. This gets us to compute and the internal virtual networks. So the feature is available in Google Cloud, in Azure, in AWS. You can basically IPv6 enable the internal network, but with Azure, uh, yeah, it's, it's three and a half years since uh, it's, it's, it's in place and, and broken. Uh, but you can, you can IPv6 enable uh, the networks and when you have IPv6 enabled the networks, you can then IPv6 enable load balancers, you can IPv6 enable compute instances, the virtual machines, uh, databases, and so on and so forth. The services that support IPv6 can be IPv6 enabled. Uh, and the compute instances, basically you can get IPv6 to uh, all the virtual machines in the three largest cloud providers. Uh, it, it just works. Uh, what is worth mentioning is the difference between uh, AWS and Google. With Google, you always get a slash 96. Uh, and if you run the HCP v6 client, you get one address from that slash 96 uh, prefix. And you can somehow identify the, the rest of the block and use the rest of the block uh, for Kubernetes or Docker or whatever. Uh, on AWS, uh, you either have to ask for uh, an address, which you get via the HCP v6, or a prefix, uh, which you get via the internal API. Uh, it's called a metadata API. Uh, you can have both on the, on the instances, but the API doesn't support uh, saying like, hey, I want a new virtual machine or interface, network interface, that has one IP address uh, managed by DHCPv6 and one prefix. You have to do it like first ask for the, uh, for the address and then, then for the prefix in two API calls which breaks Terraform and automation. Again, it's the cloud. So yeah, the Google Cloud was kind of uh, the last one uh, in the run towards IPv6 enabled virtual networks, but now they are there, finally. If you have uh, a use for object storage, like in the case of AWS, the S3 service, it is in general IPv6 enabled, However, you have to use special host names. And that's a common case with AWS. They have services that they have IPv6 enabled, but you have to ask uh, or you have to look the host name uh, that is IPv6 enabled. It's not the default one. So, yeah. okay. With databases, uh, like you can get IPv6 enabled databases, but again, with AWS, there are surprises like uh, with IPv4, you can have a database instance that is available to the internet. I'm not discussing if that's a good or bad idea. It's not a good idea. Uh, but some people do it. They have like needs. <laughs> and in case of IPv6 enabled database instance in AWS, uh, the IPv6, or actually the whole instance, uh, must be marked as private. So you can't set it as publicly available. Uh, and only have IPv4 publicly available uh, access. You have to mark the whole instance private and you get no public access to the database instance at all. Uh, again, it's a feature uh, of, of how they implemented the uh, IPv6 support. And you cannot have IPv6 only support for those databases. These always have to be dual stacked and we get to IPv6 only in the cloud shortly. Then we have cases like file storage, uh, which is usually implemented as NFS uh, endpoint somewhere in the cloud. Uh, the current state is 
that the file storage uh, in case of AWS, it's EFS, is not even listed in the IPv6 enabled services. They just omitted that item from the list because it's not IPv6 enabled at all. Uh, if you want to use it in your, in your infrastructure, you suddenly find out that if you have an IPv6 only service and you want to access this file storage, you have to go through uh, a network address translation function from IPv6 to IPv4. So let's think about containers. Uh, with Google Cloud and Kubernetes, the current approach is to use dual stack Kubernetes. The problem is that with Kubernetes, all of these pods and services consume the IPv4 address space. And ideally, we would love to not use IPv4 at all so that we don't have to think about IPv4 address space overlap or IPv4 address space runout uh, or anything like that. But still, you have to provision all the pods on Kubernetes in, in Google Cloud and in Azure with both IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, with Amazon, uh, yes, that's, that's Azure, that's Google. With Amazon, uh, the idea was to go for IPv6 only Kubernetes, but they didn't quite get there yet. They have something that they call IPv6 Kubernetes, but it's a pseudo IPv6 only Kubernetes. What does it mean? So in theory, with IPv6, uh, or sorry, uh, yeah, with IPv6, all you need is to have a uh, pod, a Kubernetes pod, with a globally routed IPv6 address. Then it goes out via the internet, sorry, via the interface uh, of the virtual machine or the host machine, uh, via something that they call egress only internet gateway, which is an interesting function because it only allows outgoing IPv6 traffic not incoming, so it, it performs what, what Fernando mentioned as the function that firewalls all the incoming traffic from, from the deployments. And then it goes to the internet. Uh, with IPv4 traffic uh, that you would want to initiate from the pods, they provision the APIPA space 169.254 uh, within the host instance, the, the virtual machine, uh, they have a very special CNI, a plugin in Kubernetes, that assigns an IPv4 address to each of the Kubernetes pod uh, next to the IPv6 addresses. So you have two interfaces in the pod, one of them IPv6 only, the other one IPv4 only. And the IPv4 traffic actually leaves uh, via the EC2 instance. It gets nutted for the first time, so there's network address translation that it gets tra uh, translated for a second time uh, on the NAT gateway, which is a function within the VPC in AWS, and then it goes to the internet gateway and then to the internet. So they will eventually get there. Uh, they are like by far, AWS is the cloud provider with the most mature IPv6 feature support, but it's still <laughs> a long road ahead. So with serverless, you get lambdas. You often can launch lambdas uh, and serverless containers in an environment that is running IPv6, but usually it's IPv6 plus IPv4. Uh, somehow, it's, you can't get really IPv6 only. And then there are API gateways and, and databases and more. And the thing is that these features are really, the, the documentation really, really, really sucks. It's really bad. Uh, and you have to look very carefully at each of the features that you have uh, uh, that you want to use and inspect what is the level of IPv6 maturity for each of the functions. So thinking about IPv6 only, it only is available in AWS. Uh, you can get IPv6 only networks uh, so that like in the cloud, you usually get a prefix assigned for the whole, uh, they call it a virtual cloud network, in, in case of AWS, it's VPC, uh, and then you, you subnet it into small networks. So you get like, like slash 56 for the whole uh, VPC, and then each of the networks, the subnets, is a slash 64, and then uh, when you attach a virtual machine, a compute instance to uh, that network, it only receives an IPv6 address via DCPv6. So that works quite well. If it's, if it's configured uh, in the virtual machine template. Sometimes it is not, so you have to be careful on what machine template are you using when you are launching IPv6 only instances. And then 
AWS has implemented DNS 6.4 and NAT 6.4 or 6.4. Uh, the DNS 6.4 is implemented as part of the uh, VPC recursive DNS resolver. Uh, you just have to enable it for a specific subnet. Uh, NAT 6.4 is part of the NAT gateway that is managed by AWS. So you don't, have to, you don't have to care much about how it works internally. You can just start issuing calls to uh, the host names that are being translated uh, via DNS 624 uh, and, and resolved to an, an IPv6 address uh, within the NAT 624 address pool. Now thinking about the enterprise stuff, uh, what you would often want to have in case of on-premises and cloud deployments are cross-connects between the enterprise uh, or on-premises and the cloud. And this is actually pretty well uh, evolved. There are features that, that, uh, that allow you to cross-connect uh, the deployments and it works. You just can uh, route the traffic via the private cross-connects between the cloud and, and your enterprise. Uh, if you have heard about bring your own IP, it works well for IPv6 as well. So you can say, let's divide a, or let's, let's take a slash 40 from our IPv6 uh, allocation from our slash 32 from RIPE NCC and take this slash 40 and announce it from the cloud via BGP. If you manage all the technical work behind that, you can have your IPv6 address space in the cloud, which is what, for example, Netflix does. So their deployment is uh, IPv6 enabled. Uh, they run in AWS. And uh, if you do a trace route, uh, then you will see that the IPv6 addresses belong to Netflix and not Amazon. So that works quite well as well. Uh, and like the latest additions uh, are that you can have a large prefix uh, and you can split it into small prefixes like slash 48 per region and then uh, carve out like slash 56s for different VPCs of your organization so that it is something that is manageable uh, in terms of how many uh, assignments do you want to, to, to use for, for, for the cloud. And uh, then you can implement uh, ACLs or ACLs uh, with like a small set of, of IP prefixes because you don't have to have that many prefixes for, for the cloud. If you are thinking about the virtual desktop in the infrastructure, uh, in case of Amazon, it supports IPv6. In case of dual stack networks, but again, not in case, the, in case of the IPv6 only networks. Uh, this is an example of like the feature uh, list of, of AWS. Uh, you can see that there are lots of greens in, on the left side and lots of reds on the right side. This is the second part of the list. Some uh, features or some, some services are not in the list at all. Uh, again, be careful. What You don't have to take a screenshot of that. It's part of the presentation. There's a link to uh, AWS, uh, which will then uh, provide you with the full list. Uh, but cloud is not just about the networks and compute instances. It's about the services that you can get uh, from other providers using things like AWS Marketplace. So I took a screenshot of how many applications and services are there in the AWS Marketplace. And it's more than 10,000 uh, in total, like in different categories, some are overlapping. Uh, but how many of them do support IPv6 the way that we can say that it really works? No one can tell. Uh, I don't think anyone has ever done a research on uh, these so many applications, software as a service, platforms as a service. Uh, so in case you want to deploy something from the catalog, you have to go and investigate uh, what is the feature parity and what is the maturity of the IPv6 support in each of those applications. Then you have automation. Uh, most of the uh, SRE people today automate with Terraform by HashiCorp, uh, and HashiCorp has they call, it, they call it like providers for each of the clouds. So they have a provider for AWS, which still has 122 issues open uh, with the IPv6 tag and 342 closed. For Azure, it's like four open and 26 closed. I'm not sure if this, this is like a better or, or worse case because it looks like maybe the development is not really happening there because there are no IPv6 features. And with Google Cloud, nine are open and 30 are closed. Uh, you will often 
find yourself in a situation where the cloud provider uh, supports IPv6 in the API, but it's not yet part, yet part of the automation infrastructure. So if you have a Golang developers, you might have to code it in Terraform uh, modules for each of the cloud providers yourself, or pay someone to do it for you, uh, or ask the developers uh, if they will do it on their spare time, which most probably they will not. So the cloud is not a cure when it comes to IPv6 because you still have to create the address plan and manage all the transition. You have to investigate uh, the support of each of the, uh, of IPv6 support of each of the services. Uh, you have to often go and IPv6 enable the services because IPv6 is not on by default yet. Uh, the feature parity is often not there. Some services or many services actually lack IPv6 support completely. And often you have to read the fine print. Uh, why would you want to deploy IPv6 in the cloud at all? Uh, well, so you might have the compliance reasons. You have to be IPv6 enabled internally or externally. Uh, you might have customers asking for it. Uh, you might want to save some costs because, for example, the NAT gateway in all the cloud providers is charging you for any traffic that goes through it. So if you have an IPv4, IPv4 traffic that has to go to the internet and back, you transfer one terabyte of data uh, through the gateway, you pay for one terabyte of data. While if you use IPv6, you can go to the internet directly and skip this. There are no, like, no costs related to any address translation because there is no address translation. So it will save you some costs. It will eventually save you costs in case you need readdressing and, and so on and so forth, uh, which no one of us likes. Uh, so that's like the next point. Uh, if you need to resolve the resource exhaustion, IP address uh, exhaustion and so on, then you might have a reason for IPv6 only, which is not really the cure in the cloud yet either. Uh, you might want to avoid IP address collisions uh, because of mergers, acquisitions, or different deployments that you need to cross-connect suddenly. With IPv6, you always get a unique prefix in the, in the cloud and that prefix is different to what you have on-premise. And what I think is important is that you should be experimenting with IPv6 only, because that's the future. And there are limitations of the cloud. Uh, let's go briefly through those. Azure and one-to-one -one IPv6 NAT. I, I can't like, stress how much I find this wrong. Uh, <laughs> uh, with AWS, the, database, the databases don't work with IPv6 only networks. Uh, and there are some other limitations that I've mentioned. And another example of AWS client uh, VPN, which is basically open VPN deployment, isn't supporting IPv6 at all, which brings me to what Fernando mentioned, that some vendors simply don't support IPv6 in their VPN solutions. And you don't want to use them if you have to route IPv6 traffic to the VPN. So let's think about more limitations like Azure Firewall, which is intelligent, best of breed, unrestricted cloud scalability, whatever, and then it doesn't support IPv6. <laughs> like, why? <laughs> it can operate in dual stack networks, but it's like no use for IPv6. Uh, with Kubernetes, this is AWS Kubernetes. Don't attempt to read it. <laughs> it's a long list. Read the fine print later on. Uh, if you think about multi-cloud, it's even harder because then you have to figure out what feature is supported in which cloud environment and then so on and so forth. Be careful. Be careful about surprises like uh, Microsoft enabling IPv6 on uh, Azure Active Directory, which is a cloud service, uh, but a different one. It's like a typical cloud service, but it's, it is a cloud uh, service that forced enterprises to review if they might have some cases where the uh, enterprise environment might suddenly lose access to the Active Directory because uh, some IP addresses might not be in ACLs that would allow access to it and so on. Uh, so the, then you might be thinking about geolocation of your, of your uh, IP addresses internally and externally. Uh, if you have any external block lists, like you, you allow some users access from the enterprise to the internet over IPv4 and you suddenly enable that service in the internet over IPv6 or someone else manages that service and enables it over IPv6, uh, be careful. Uh, be ready to update the block lists and allow lists. Uh, and firewall rules, that's basically quite similar. You can have the same in the cloud and you have to manage that these uh, are up to date. And finally, ask your developers, train your developers for 
applications with proper dual stack application support and IPv6 only application support. And that is an important point. Train your developers, provide your developers with IPv6 networks in the office, uh, at home, using that VPN solution that was proposed today, uh, in the cloud, uh, build IPv6 enabled apps, test the applications in the IPv6 only development environment because one day the cloud will come up with IPv6 only Kubernetes and suddenly you might find out that the applications don't work when you want to deploy those applications in, in such an environment. Uh, and finally, you are the customer of the cloud. Ask your vendors, prepare yourself to avoid surprises, build your lab, start early, ask for feature parity uh, where it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Ask for IPv6 on by default, which is not the case. Uh, and don't forget about security. So there are resources, links here. Uh, and there's a great article on APNIC blog, the last uh, item in the list, which provides you with the tables comparing some of the features of the clouds. Uh, so in case this talk isn't what you expected, that link might be. Now it's time for questions and some answers, hopefully. I'm, I'm just going to be strict, Fernando. You can't, no, because you run over by many minutes. So who has a question? <laughs> <laughs> you, you're penalized here. Nobody has a question, so then Fernando's going to get a question. <laughs> Short. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, uh, first, great talk. Um, I, was, I wanted to ask, like, in the case of um, AWS Kubernetes, you said that pods are assigned, like, global addresses, right? So they were, but you have still two, NAT, two layers of NAT, right? Yeah, but that's for IPv4. Okay. So they, uh, what they currently don't support is Kubernetes within the IPv6 only networks. So they deploy IPv6 within the dual stack networks, but the pods uh, are provisioned with IPv6 only configuration. So in case you have an uh, traffic between the services within Kubernetes, it should go over IPv6. Uh, there is IPv6 not in place for the services because that's how Kubernetes works. Uh, but if you go from the port to the internet to an IPv6 enabled service, uh, then the traffic is over IPv6. With, you see the global uh, unique address of the, of the port in the web server log, for example. But if you, in the port, uh, choose to communicate with the IPv4 only host in the internet or any IPv4 only service in AWS, it gets uh, out via the second interface, which is that very special second interface created by AWS uh, C Kubernetes CNI uh, with the APIPA address. Excellent, thank you. This was a great talk. Okay. We'll thank you very much, Radek, and I'll invite Nico on the stage. Tell us more about Kubernetes. Thank you. <laughs>